Hello, everybody, and welcome to Commodity Culture, where we break down the commodity space for both new and experienced investors. Before we dive in, standard disclaimer, nothing here is investing advice. Do your own due diligence. And today's guest is the president and founder of Pento Portfolio Strategies with over 30 years of professional investment experience. It's Mr. Michael Pento. Welcome to the show. Thanks for having me on, Jesse. So I want to get started like I do with all new guests with their origin story. So how did you first discover investing and how did that road lead you to founding Pento Portfolio Strategies? Well, if you want to go all the way back, I mean, I used to watch, um, it was called CNN FNN at, at the time. Uh, my father would watch it when I was a kid. And I'm like, this is the most boring thing I've ever seen in my life. Why would anybody watch, uh, you know, stock symbols go across the bottom of a, of a screen? Um, and then it, it, hit, it hit me at one point. It was like an epiphany. Like, wait a second. Money can work for me. I just don't have to earn money. I can actually have my money work for me in addition to me earning money. So I thought that was fascinating at the time. I know, forgive the, um, you know the insophistication of it all, but that's what got me hooked on it. And then, you know, I worked on the floor of the New York Stock Exchange for a few years. Um, I had seemed to have a knack for understanding markets and the economy. Uh, I drew a little bit of a following to myself, which eventually led to the opening of Penta Portfolio Strategies in 2012. I wrote a book at that time also called The Coming Bond Market Collapse, which, which was greatly derided for many years, but I just laid out the foundation um, and it wasn't a timing tool. It didn't say that the bond market was going to you know, implode uh, the day after it was published by Wiley. Um, I just laid out the scenario as to, as, as to why I thought the bond market was going to someday, someday dissolve. And it would be either because of inflation um, or the Fed would have to blow it up itself. So, um, and maybe both. And that's exactly what's happening now. So why don't we start off with that then, what you're seeing in the bond market right now and how that relates to what you wrote in your book. Um, and do you see a collapse of the bond market coming anytime? Obviously impossible to time, but um, here in the near term future, what are your thoughts? Well, the collapse of the bond market is happening. There's no doubt about that, but it's happening in cycles. So we're going to go through these iterations of bond market debacles. Um, so you know, you when you go from ten of the last fourteen years at zero percent interest rates, free but free money, pretty much, and it's not only here; it was throughout the world. We had some seventeen trillion dollars of bond yields below zero, both on the sovereign level and on the corporate level throughout the world. Now that numbers come way way down, um, but the bond bubble is global in nature. Just look what's happening in Japan. You know. Japan is slowly relaxing yield curve control. Um, it's basically an insolvent retirement community with, uh, I think it's 1.3 quadrillion yen in debt outstanding. Inflation is 8%, their annual inflation rate for food. And yet so they somehow going out 10 years want to keep their bond yield um, below 1%. It's like 0.6% right now. But that's that's just not something the market really likes. So the bond market is blowing up right now. The Fed has caused it right now because they just simply, they've raised rates from zero to five and a quarter to five and a half percent in the span of 16 months. Um, so inflation caused them to do it. And the inflation it caused the Fed to raise interest rates. It's causing the Bank of Japan to relax yield curve control. I think that's going to blow up the economy. That's going to send them back into the um, yield curve control business in a big way globally. And you're going to see these various iterations. But I think the whole thing is going to be that the faith in sovereign credit and money supply, sound money is being destroyed globally. That's a fact. So you're going to see times where you see bond yields explode through the roof, especially in high yield credit. In other words, junk bonds, that's going to go through the roof at times, and it's going to come crashing down. And you're going to see dynamics in the credit markets like we've never seen before. That's my prediction. That was the prediction in the book, and that is happening for without a doubt. Well, let's switch from the bond market to the stock market now, because you've mentioned that you think the market is currently in an extended and protracted bounce within a bear market and not a new bull market, as a lot of these mainstream media outlets are proclaiming. So talk to us about what you're seeing there. 
Well, this is just a typical bear market bounce. I mean, it shouldn't really surprise many people. You know, from March 2000 through the fall of 2002, the NASDAQ lost 83% of its value. But during that time frame, the NASDAQ had four rallies. Some of them were 28%, between 28% and 49%. So they had huge rallies. So bull markets, this, this is what I think bull markets start from. Bull markets start after asset bubbles pop. When inflation is firmly under control and debt levels sort of they 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 get um, reset to, to use a word. So, you know, you have this massive debt default and people stop paying their loans. And, you know, think about happening in 2008 where you see just massive debt default, mortgages default. And then you could start all over again and home prices reset down 33 percent. So when, let, let's look at the situation. today. Let's just say let's just say, Mr. Pento, maybe you're wrong. Maybe this is the start of this new massive bull market. But home price, the home price to income ratio right now is at a record high. The national home price to income ratio at a record high. That is not when bull markets begin. The total market cap of equities as a percentage of the economy, percentage of GDP, is higher today than at any other time prior than 2020. The price to sales ratio is very close to a record high higher than any other time prior than 2020. So bull markets don't start when the real Fed's fund when the real Fed funds rate goes from minus eight to positive uh two and a half. That's not that's not when bull markets begin. When the, when the Fed hikes rates from zero to 5.3% and does Q is doing QT and the net percentage of banks tightening lending standards is 50%. Those are all recessionary indicators. The, the index of leading indi economic indicators, the National Federation of Independent Businesses, are both screaming recession. The inverted yield curve being inverted now for over a year and at 75 basis points, over 100 at its high, is, is screaming recession. And, and finally, bull markets don't begin when inflation is 3%, actually 3.2. So it was 3% in, in June. It's now 3.2% year over year in July. It's 50% above the Fed's target and rising. These So all those things I just mentioned are not the conditions conducive for a bull market to begin. They're conducive for a bear market, phase two of the bear market, to commence with a vengeance I don't know if it happens. I, I don't think it ha it's going to happen tomorrow. I have a model that I created and hope to talk about it in, in, in a few minutes. But the bear market is going to happen. It's going to bring about this grand reconciliation of asset prices. The model tells me it's not going to happen tomorrow, but it's out there in the near term. And getting the timing right is crucial. My next question is about the model you created called the inflation deflation economic cycle model. So could you walk us through that and explain where we are today looking through the lens of that model? So it's basically a 20 component model that's been rigorously back tested to find the best components to understand the second derivative, the rate of change of the rate of change of growth and inflation with an emphasis on inflation. And if you get that right, you tend to avoid very succinctly, avoid recessions and depressions. That's when you want to get out of the stock market. But it also helps you understand when we're into something called stagflation or intractable inflation, where you see growth stagnant, but you see rapidly rising inflation, which, by the way, is a wonderful se sector. I call it, I have five sectors, which range between deflation and depression all the way to hyperinflation, stagflation, intractable inflation in sector five. Um, that's the great sector for, that's the best sector for commodities. But you don't want to own commodities when you're in deflation, disinflation, recession, depression. That's the that's the place where commodities get blown up. Now, we were flirting for a while, think about March of 2023, which by the way, seems like light years away, right? <laughs> it doesn't seem like a long time ago when, um, when the banking system imploded, four banks went under, and then uh, Jerome Powell bailed out the entire banking system. So we went from sectors between sectors one and two all the way to sectors uh, three and four very quickly. 
which are sort of, especially sector four is bullish for commodities. July was a condition where inflation actually re-accelerated um, and growth did as well. So it's, it's, a, it's a mini cycle. It's a cycle within a cycle. But I, I'm firmly, I firmly believe because of what I just mentioned before, because the Fed went from zero to five and a five point three percent on the effective funds rate in sixteen months, because they're still doing quantitative tightening, because the number of banks tightening lending standards is above fifty percent, because of the leading economic indicators, because of the National Federation of Independent Businesses, because of the inverted yield curve, because 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 of all the things that I can mention, the recession has been held in abeyance, but it's coming. So the next phase that I'm looking at is going to be one of disinflation, deflation, and recession. And a sharp one, that's going to be followed by the next, they call it the commodity super cycle. I believe that should come should come with a vengeance and might might be maybe a year or so out. That's the way I see things now. So if this commodity super cycle is coming next year, a few years out, at the moment, do you think it's not a good time to be in commodities? And how do you view, do you view the precious metals differently, gold and silver, than you do uh, base metals, agricultural commodities, et cetera? Yeah, they're totally different. So gold is uh, money. Gold is real and honest money. Currency, money, um, call it what you want. I call it money. Um, base metals and energy are not money. Um they, they tend to trade along with the second derivative of growth and inflation. So if you see an economy on a global basis, and I look at the top three nations, you talk about the European Union, China, and the United States. Those are the three nations I focus on most, most um, you know, myopically. And if those nations are experiencing recession and disinflation, look, look what's going on in China. I mean, China can't get off its mat. It's supposed to be this big boom from a COVID reopening. Um, it just never materialized. They're just an over-indebted economy. And I, and I try to explain that to people. They have a huge overhang, a fixed asset bubble. They have to work off. There's not much they can really do there. Uh, m many parts in Europe, France uh, in particular, Germany, they're just either in recession or about to enter recession. Southern Europe is not is not doing well either. And the United States is the best of the bunch, but headed into this next cycle of recession. So when you see that waning demand from for commodities, base metals and energy, totally different than gold. So people think of gold as an inflation hedge, blah, blah, blah hedge against the falling currency. What you really want to look at with gold, you want to look at falling nominal rates and falling real rates. That's when gold shines the brightest. And when does that happen? It usually happens in a recession where the Fed is lowering interest rates. So lowering nominal rates, gold doesn't pay any interest. So the com competition from for dollars goes away, right? Um, and then real rates fall. So inflation subtracted from nominal rates is rising. So that usually occurs when? That's especially a, a salient issue when the Fed starts printing money and goes into QE. So think about when was the best time to buy gold? If you could think of maybe after the liquidity crisis, so you sold it in the fall of 2008 and bought it back, say, in March of 2009. So it's used as a as a, a way of raising money in a liquidity crisis like we had in the, in the fall of 2008. Uh, did well up until that point. And then it, they, people just sold everything for dollars. And then after that, it was like, hey, wait, the Fed took interest rates to zero by the end of 2008. They started this quantitative easing program. So we knew that in... Nominal rates were capped at zero. They weren't going anywhere, yet inflation was going to tick up, which means real rates are falling, which means you got to buy gold with both hands. That is not the same calculation as when do I buy copper? It's just not the same. And how do you view silver? Does it follow gold in that sense, or do you see it more as an industrial metal alongside copper? Silver is a hybrid. So it's a hybrid, it's a, it's a monetary metal, and it's also an industrial metal. So you get a little bit of both. So silver might act okay in a deflation and a depression if it weren't for the fact that, hey, wait a second, we're, we're using these, uh, the, the silver for, for um, uh, photo cells. So um, you know that, that's going to ease the demand for um, industrial use for silver. So um, when I when I see the economy heading for a recession or a depression, 
or a deflation, I want to focus my ownership of gold when I think of precious metals. You can have some silver, but it's mostly gold because it's pure. It is a pure form of money, not silver. And what do you make of the BRICS nations and their desire to move away from the US dollar as a currency to settle trade, potentially with a gold-backed currency? There's been a lot of rumors swirling out there. A lot of gold bugs are pointing to this as a big catalyst. But as you mentioned, China's economy is in big trouble. Um, We saw Russia today, I believe, have an emergency rate hike. The central bank hiked rates, I think it was over 360 basis points. Um, So things aren't looking really rosy there either. How do you view the BRICS alliance? Do you think they'll be able to launch and implement a gold or commodities-backed currency? And how much of an impact would that have? I I do. Um, So I don't incorporate that to my day-to-day trading because it's it's more of a... um, protracted trend away from the dollar. It's just, it's more about the loss of faith on the part of our foreign credit creditors in our treasury and in our central bank. So, and it's more than just protection from sanctions when people say, well, you know, um, you know, if I get in trouble with the United States, they're going to freeze my, my reserves. And then I, I, I can't do anything. You know, that, that it's more than that. It's, it's political, fiscal and monetary insanity. Um, and it's resembling more and more like that of a banana republic. So it's 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 a combination of the two. It's not just um, I want to protect myself from U.S. sanctions. It's that I I have to have my reserves placed in something that holds its value. And that used to be follow you know after World War II, after the Bretton Woods Agreement, it used to be um, the dollar. That's no longer the case. I mean, look at look at the political madness that we have here where we're, you know, I don't want to get too political here. And I'm, I'm, I'm a libertarian, so I'm either Republican or a Democrat. But when you see a regime, the current regime, arresting the previous regime, that that's something that you see happening in banana republics. And when you see a nation that has embraced free money, 0% interest rates, like I said, for 10 of the last 14 years, that's a banana republic. Look at the nation's debt. We're at 30, almost $33 trillion, 120% debt to G- GDP. Do you know, Jesse, that by 2040, the CBO predicts that we're going to spend 100% of all of our revenue just to pay for entitlements and interest? This is a banana republic. It screams to me, banana republic. So, yes, I believe the BRICs have to adopt their own currency, and back it with gold. Yes, a lot of those same Banana Republic shenanigans are going on in my home country of Canada as well. Um, One of the reasons why I left and relocated myself to the Balkans. But it, it does feel to me sometimes that the Fed and governments of these Western nations are making such poor decisions when it comes to the economy, policy, et cetera, that perhaps they are not incompetent, but rather malevolent and are intentionally causing problems with the economy and with society at large. Could this be a possibility in your view? Well, there's no doubt that they're feckless. Um, Most of them are megalomaniacs though also. So they'll do whatever they can to maintain power. It's all about power for them. They care nothing about philosophy. They don't care anything about our prodigy, progeny. What they care about is maintaining power. And that is evident. Listen, let just look at what happened in March of this year. And it happened almost instantaneously. So you had a couple of banks fail. So what did Powell do? Did he say, well, that's capitalism and banks shouldn't take in such a crazy risk in cryptocurrency or had such a large concentration of depositors that were way above the, the um, FDIC insurance? No, he didn't say that. What he said was, I am opening something called the Bank Term Funding Program. And he immediately printed $400 billion in the space of two weeks. He guaranteed all deposits, FDIC deposits. And and this program took every asset, every treasury asset and every mortgage-backed security of every single bank. It enabled every single bank to take their assets that were that are still way underwater and becoming more so underwater and hand them off to the Fed at par, full value, for one year. 
Now, that is a banana republic move. And he did it. It wasn't a big fa fanfare. A lot of people didn't call it QE. I didn't even call it QE. I call it QE light. But it has the same effect of bailing out the entire banking system because of a few. I mean, I know there were large banks. There weren't, there weren't small banks. But where is the where is the where is the um, gales of creative destruction? Joseph Schumpeter used to say, he's a well-known economist. Where, where are the market forces? It's a country who's built on um, the ability to fail and the the ability to succeed. They're gone, and that's that's one another reason why um, this country's in big trouble. Unfortunately. Well, let's end on this. How do you see all of these forces, all of these events, the political hubris, the megalomania, um, the massive debt that seems completely untenable? How do you see that all coming to an end? And do you see potential light on the other side of that? Is there going to be a reintroduction of gold, not just from BRICS, but to the West as well, um, backing the currency? Are we going to see sound politics eventually someday um at the uh, on the other end of of all of this uh chaos and stupidity that we're seeing today well i believe in i believe in entropy um and i also believe in the power of prayer so you always have hope um but it, it, what you just mentioned is only going to happen um when the apocalypse apocalypse comes because there's, there's no there's no willingness to to uh undergo a depression which is what's needed. A cathartic depression is needed for a few years just to clear out all the imbalances. And let me just me mention a few. So we have record debt, all right, and soaring servicing costs on, pop on top of that debt. Consumer credit card debt is over $1 trillion. Uh, 401k hardship loans are up 36% year over year. Con uh, consumer debt is up $3 trillion alone since COVID. 20% of all listed shares in the United States are zombies, meaning they have to sell debt, new debt, to pay off the interest on existing debt. This, this is all an untenable situation, which is has to come crashing down. I know it doesn't look like it now if you just Google the last trade in NVIDIA. I get it but it has to happen. It's necessary and it's going to be healthy, but it's going to be very painful and you have to know how to negotiate it correctly to survive. Well, thank you so much for joining us today, Michael. Really appreciated the conversation. For those who want to learn more, uh, could you tell us about Pento Portfolio Strategies? Well, the website is pentoport.com. You can get a free trial subscription to a podcast called The Midweek Reality Check, where I give you a lot of honest data out there and some honest interpretation of that data. It costs $50 a year if you want it. Um, and if you don't want it, it's a five-week trial that expires. So um, it's called the Midweek Reality Check. And if you are a U.S. citizen and you have $100,000 to invest, I will manage your money according to the IDAC model, which I have a lot of my money in personally too, because I, I really manage it in, in a way that preserves and protects your principal. It's designed to avoid recessions and depressions. That's when you lose most of your money, 30, 40, 50%. That's coming. I don't think that's been avoided at all. It's been held in abeyance. It has not been averted. And then when things clear out, to invest in the right sectors, the, the correct style factors um, in the bull market, which is hopefully to come and will come after the reconciliation. So um, pentaport.com, the office number is 732-772-9500. Give us a call. Great. I'll put all that information in the description below. Thank you once again for joining us, Michael, and sharing your knowledge with the audience. Thank you, Jesse. Commodity Culture is a series on commodities and natural resources. If you would like to see more, be sure to subscribe and hit the bell notification so you're always up to date with the latest episodes.